from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston. It's the Cube, covering IBM Think. Brought to you by IBM. Hi, everybody. We're back, and this is Dave Vellante, and you're watching the Cube's continuous coverage of the IBM Think 2020 digital events experience. Sriram Viswanathan is here. He is the global managing director for government, healthcare, and life sciences. Sriram, thanks so much for coming on the Cube. Great to be with you, Dave. I wish we were yeah. there in person, but it's it's it, great to be here digitally. Indeed, it would be good to be face to face in uh, in San Francisco. But this certainly will uh, help our audience understand what's happening in these critical sectors. I mean, you are at the heart of it. I mean, these are three sectors, and then there are subsectors in there. Let's try to understand how you're communicating with your clients, what you've been doing in the near term, and then I want to really try to understand, you know, what you see coming out of this. But please tell us. What's been going on in your, in your world? You're right. I mean, these sectors are keeping, keeping the engine running right now in terms of uh, keeping society running, right? So if you look at the federal government, the state government, the local governments, you look at providers of uh, healthcare, you look at payers who are making sure that their members are getting the, getting the advice and the service they need. You look at uh, life sciences companies who are rapidly trying to find a cure for this, uh, for this virus. And then you look at education where... Um, you know, the education establishments are trying to work remotely and make sure that our children get the education they need. So kind of existential industries right front and center of this. 95, interestingly, Dave, 95% of IBMers have continued to work from home and yet we are able to support um, the core operations of our clients. So if you look at some of the things that we've been doing over the last eight or nine weeks that we've been under this kind of lockdown, um, IBM, IBM is involved in the engine room. I, I would like to call it the engine room of many of these operations, right? Whether it is to keep a city running or a hospital running, um, our systems, our software, our services teams are engaged in making sure that the core systems that allow those entities to function are actually operational um, during these times. So we've had no blips. We've been able to support that. And that's a, that's a key part of it. Now, of course, there are ex uh, extraordinary things we've done on top. For instance, you know, in the first two weeks after the crisis started, we used um, our supercomputer with the Department of Energy that you must have heard about uh, yep. to, to narrow down over 8,000 compounds that could potentially be cures for the COVID-19 virus and narrowed down to 80 that could be applicable, right? Um, so shortening the time and allowing researchers now to focus on 80 compounds instead of 8,000 so that we can get a vaccine to market faster. And that's tremendous, right? I mean, we've, we've formed a, a supercomputing, um, uh, you know, collaboration uh, with, with 27 other uh, partners um, that, who are all co-innovating uh, using modeling techniques uh, to try and find a cure faster. On the other end, um, you look at things like what we're doing with the state of New York, where we worked with the government uh, with Do It to get 350,000 uh, tablets with the right security software, with the right educational software, so that students can continue to learn while uh, you know while they are uh, while they're remote with the right connectivity. So uh, extremes, and then of course as a backbone. You know, we're using, we're starting to see real use of our AI tools, chatbots to start with, that we have, uh, we have allowed uh, uh, customers to use for free so that we can answer the, we can, we can consume the latest CDC advice, the latest advice from the governors and the state, and then um, allow the, the technology to answer a lot of queries that are coming through uh, with, with, uh, with citizens being worried about what, where they stand every single day. Yeah, so let's kind of break down some of the sectors that you, you follow. Um, let's start with, with government. I mean, certainly in the United States, it's been all about the fiscal policy, the monetary policy, injecting cash into the system, liquidity, you know, supporting the credit markets. Certainly central banks around the world are, are facing, you know, similar but somewhat different depending on their financial situations. Um, and so that's been the near term tactical focus. And it actually seems to be working pretty well. Uh, if, you know, if the stock market's any indicator. But going forward, I'm interested in your thoughts. You wrote a blog and you, it basically was a call to action to the government to really kind of reinvent its workforce, bringing in uh, millennials. Um, and, and so my, my, my question to you, is, you is, is how do you think the millennial workforce, you know, when we exit this thing, 
will embrace the government? What does the government have to do to attract millennials who want the latest and greatest technology? I mean, give us your thoughts on that. Well, it's, an, it's a really interesting question. A couple of years ago, I was talking about uh, this is the time where governments have to have to really transform. They have to change. If you, if you go back in time, compare governments to other industries, uh, governments have embraced technology, but it's been still kind of slow, in, incremental, right? Lots of systems of record, big, massive systems that take 10 years, five years to implement. So we've implemented systems of record. We've, we've started using data and analytics to kind of inform policy making, but they tend to be sequential. And I think, uh, you know, coming back to the, to the changing workforce, uh, what is it, by 2025, 75% of the workforce are going to be millennials. Right. Um, and as they come into the workforce, I think they're going to demand that, uh, that we work in new ways, in new, uh, more integrated, more digitally savvy ways. And uh, strangely enough, I think this crisis is going to be, uh, is a proof point, right? Uh, many governments are working remotely and yet they're functioning okay. Um, the, the, the world of um, you know, providing policy seems to be working even if you're, if you're remote. So a lot of the naysayers who said we could not operate, digi operate digitally um, now are starting to, starting to get past that, uh, that bias, if you like. And so I think as, as uh, digital natives come into the fore, what we are going to see is this, uh, is this restless innovation of why do we do things the same way as we've done them for the last 20, 30 years. Um, granted, we need to still have the, um, the, the division of policies, make sure that we are enforcing the policies of government. But at the same time, if you look at workflow, uh, this is the time where you can use automation, intelligent workflows, right? This is the time where we can use insights about what our citizens need so that services are tuned, are hyper-local, are relevant to what the citizen is going through at that particular time, are contextual, and um, are relevant to what, this, what that individual needs at that particular time. Uh, rather than us having to go to a portal and uh, submit an application, submit relevant documents, and then be told uh, a few hours or a few minutes later that, that you've, got, you've got approval for something, right? So I think there's this period of restless innovation coming through. That is from a citizen engagement perspective. But behind the scenes in terms of how budgeting works, how approvals work, how uh, uh, you know, the divisions between federal, state, local, how the handoffs between agencies work, all of that is going to be restlessly innovated. And uh, this is the moment. I think this is going to be a trigger point. We believe it's going to be a trigger point for that kind of a transformation. You know, Suram, I've talked to a number of, of CIOs in, in sort of hard hit industries, um, hospitality, you know, certainly, you know, the restaurant uh, business, airlines, and, and, you know, they just basically had to dial down spending um, and, and really just shift to only mission critical activities. Uh, in, in your segments, it's, it's mixed, right? I mean, obviously government, you use the engine room uh, analogy before. Some, some have used the war room metaphor, but you think about healthcare, frontline workers. So it's, it's, it's mixed. What are CIOs telling you in, in the industries in which you're focused? Well, the CIOs right now, I mean, they, you're going to go through different phases, right? Uh, phase one is just reactive. It's just coping with the uh, with the situation today where you suddenly have 95%, 100% of your workforce working remote. So it's right. providing the network ability, it's, a, it's providing the leadership, the ability to, to work remotely where possible. Um, and take IBM, for instance, you know, we've got 350,000 people around the world, 95% of whom are working remotely. Um, but we've been, we've been preparing for moments like this where uh, you know, we've got the tools, we've got the network bandwidth, we've got the security app apparatus, uh, we've been modernizing our applications. Um, so you've been going to a hybrid cloud kind of architecture where you're able to scale up and scale down, stand up additional uh, capacity when you need it. So I think a lot of the CIOs that we talk to are, uh, you know, phase one was all about how do I keep everything running? Phase two is uh, how do I prepare for the new norm where I think more collaborative tools are going to come into, in, into the work environment. Um, CIOs are going to be much more involved in how do I uh, get design in the center of everything that we do, no matter what kind of industry you're in. So uh, it's, go it's going to be an interesting change as to the role of the CIO going forward, Dave. And I think, uh, again, it's a catalyst to saying, why do we have to do things the same way we've been doing? Why do we need so many people in an office building? 
doing things in, in traditional ways and why can't we use these digital techniques as the new norm? Yeah, there are a lot of learnings going on and I think uh, you know, huge opportunities to, 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 to save money going forward because we've had to do that in the near term. But, but more importantly, it's like, how are we going to invest in the future? And that's, that's something that I think a lot of people are beginning now to think about. They haven't had much time to do anything but other than think tactically. But now we're at the point where, okay, we're maybe starting to come out of this a little bit, trying to envision how we come back. And organizations, I think, are beginning to think about, okay, what is our mid to longer term strategy? It's, we're not just gonna go back to, to 2019. So right. what do we do going forward? So we're starting to spend more cycles and more energy you know, on that topic. What, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, take every segment of my, uh, my sector, right? Take the education industry. Will you, uh, will you spend $60,000, $70,000 a year to send a child to university um, when a lot of the learning is available digitally and when, when we have seen that they can learn as much and probably more uh, in a more agile manner and follow their interests? So I think the whole education industry is going to leverage digital in a big way. And I think you're going to see partnerships form. You can see more, uh, you're going to see more choice uh, for the student and for the parents uh, in the education industry. And so that industry, which has been kind of following the same type of pattern, uh, you know, for, for 100 years, is suddenly going to reinvent itself. Take the healthcare industry. Um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of providers are following, uh, following staff because elective, uh, elective treatment has really, you know, uh, fallen uh, tremendously, right? Uh, on the one hand, you have huge demand for COVID-19 related uh, uh, treatment. On the other hand, electives have come down. So cost is a big issue. So I, I believe we're going to see M&A activity uh, in that sector. And as you see that, what's going to happen is people are going to uh, restlessly reinvent. So, you know, I think telemedicine is, going to, is, is now going to become a reality. I think um, if you look at the payer space and if you look at the insurance providers, they're all going to be in the market saying, how, how do I capture more members and retain them? And how do I give them more choice? Um, and how do I keep them safe? It's interesting. I was speaking to a colleague in Japan uh, yesterday, and he, he was saying to me in the automotive industry that um, I, I was arguing that, you know, you will see a huge downfall. Uh, but his argument back was people are actually so afraid of taking public transport that uh, they, they're expecting to see a spike in personal transportation, right? So I think from a government perspective, the kind of policy implications, um, you know, whether, whether it be economic stimulus related, in the short term, governments are going to introduce inefficiencies to get the economy back to where it needs to be. But over a long term, I think we're back to these efficiencies. We're going to look at supply chain. There's going to be a post-mortem on how did we get where we got to now? And um, so I think in terms of citizen engagement, in terms of supply chain, in terms of back office operations, in terms of how agencies coordinate, um, do stockpiling, command and control, all of that is gonna change, right? And it's an exciting time in a way to be at the forefront of these industries shaping, shaping the future. I wanna ask your thoughts on, on education and <clears throat> excuse me, drill into that a little bit. Uh, I've actually got you know personal visibility in, in sort of let's let's break it down. Um, um, you know, secondary universities, uh, uh, nine through twelve and K through six, and you're seeing some definite differences. Uh, I think actually the universities are pretty well set up. They've been doing online courses for quite some time. They've they've started you know revenue streams in that regard, and and so their technology is pretty good and their processes are pretty good. At the other end of the spectrum, sort of the K through six, well, you know, there's, there's a lot of homeschooling going on and, and parents are at home. They're adjusting pretty well, whether it's young kids with manipulatives or basic math and vocabulary skills, they're able to support that and, you know, adjust their work lives accordingly. I find in the, in the high school, it's, it's really different. I mean, it's new to these folks. I had an interesting conversation with my son last night. And he was explaining to me, he spends literally hours a day just trying to figure out what he's got to do because every process is different from every teacher. And so that's that sort of fat middle, if you will, which is a critical time, especially for juniors in high school and so forth, where that is so new. And I wonder what you're seeing in maybe in those three sectors, is that sort of consistent with what you see? And, and what do you see coming out of this? 
I think it's it, it's broadly cons consistent. I have personal experience. I have one university grade uh, university senior, and I have a high school senior, and I see pretty much the same pattern no matter which part of the world they're in. Right. I I do believe that um, you know this this notion of choice for students and how they learn and making curriculum customized to get the best out of students is the new reality. How fast we'll get there, how do you get there, it's not a linear line. I think what is gonna happen is you're gonna, you're gonna see partnerships between uh, content providers, you're gonna see partnerships between platform providers, and you're gonna see these educational institutions uh, less restlessly reinvent to say, okay, this particular student learns in this way and this is, this is how I shape a personalized curriculum, but still achieving a minimum outcome, right? I think that's gonna come, but it's gonna take a few years to get there. I think it was a really interesting observations. I mean, many children that I observe today are sort of autodidactic. And if you give them the tooling to actually set their own learning curriculum, they'll, they'll absorb that. And obviously the, the technology has gotta be there to support it. So sort of hitting the escape key. Let's sort of end on that. I mean, in terms of just IBM, how you're positioning in the industries that you're focused on to help people take this new technology journey. As I said, we're not going back to last decade. It's a whole new world that we're gonna, gonna come out of this post COVID. And how do you see IBM as positioned there, Sriram? Dave, I think IBM is positioned brilliantly. Um, as you know, we've, we've, Arvind Krishna is, a, is our new CEO and uh, he, he recently talked about this on CNBC. So if you look at the core platforms that we've been building, right? Um, so our, our clients in the industry, whether, it's, whether it be government, healthcare, life sciences, or education, are going to look for speed. They're going to look for agility. They're going to look to change processes quickly so they can, they can react to situations like this in the future in a much more agile way, right? In order to do that, their IT systems, their applications, their infrastructure needs to scale up and down needs to be, uh, you, you need to be able to configure things in a way where you can change parameters, you can change policies without having to wait a long time, right? And so if you think about things like hybrid cloud, our investment in, uh, in, in Red Hat, uh, our, uh, our uh, position on data and open technologies, and uh, you know, our policies around making sure that the, our clients' data and insights are their insights and we, you know, we don't monetize that. All of those things are, are investments in blockchain, a deep, deep uh, incumbency in services, whether it be our technology services or our consulting services, a deep industry knowledge, allowing all of these technologies to be used at, to solve these problems. Um, I think we are really well positioned. And uh, you know, a, a great example is the New York example, right? So. Uh, getting 350,000 students to work in a completely new way in a matter of two weeks is not something that every single company can do. It's not just a matter of providing the, tech, the, the tool itself. It's the content, it's the consumption, it's the design, it's the experience. And that's where uh, a company like IBM can bring everything together. And then you have the massive issues of government like social reform, like mental health, like making sure the stimulus money is going to the people who need it the most um, in, in the most uh, useful way. And that's where our work between industries, between government and banks and other industries really comes to, comes to fruition. So I think we have the technology, got the services depth, and I think we've got the relevance in the industry to make a difference. And I'm excited about the future. Well, it's interesting. You, you mentioned, you know, the, basically one of my takeaways is that you've got to be agile. You've got to be flexible. You, you've been in the consulting business for you know, most of your career. And in the early part of your career, and even up until, you know, maybe recently, we were automating processes that we knew well. Uh, yeah. But today, the, the processes are, we, so much is unknown. And so you've got to move fast. You've got to be agile. You've got to experiment uh, and apply that the sort of, you know, test experiment methodology and iterate and have that continuous improvement. That's a different world than what we've known. Obviously, you know, as I say, you've seen this over the decades. Uh, your final thoughts on uh, on the future? Well, my final thoughts are, um, you, you know, I'm, you're exactly right. I mean, if I take a simple example, right, that that. Uh, controls how quickly the commerce works. Think about simple things like bill of lading, 
uh, the government has to issue. A federal government has to approve it, a state government has to approve it, and local government has to approve it. Why? That's the way we've been doing it for a long time, right? There are control points. But to your point, imagine if you can shorten that from a, a seven day cycle to a seven second cycle, the impact on commerce, the impact on GDP. The, the, and this is one simple process. This is the time for us to, re, to, to, to break it all apart and say, why not do something differently? And the technology is right. The, the AI is getting more, more and more mature. And you've got interesting things like quantum to, to look forward to. So I think the time is right for, for reinventing uh, the core of this industry. Yep, I think they really are. I mean, as difficult as this crisis has been, a lot of opportunities going to present themselves coming out of it. Sriram, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and making this happen. Really appreciate your time. It's great to have been here. Thank you for having me, Dave. You're very welcome. And thank you, everybody, for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE and our continuous coverage of the IBM Think 2020 digital event experience. Keep it right there. We'll be right back right after this short break. Thank you.